Well, good morning and welcome to Severn Christian Church. My name is Chris Maddox. And this morning, I want to start by taking us back to an event that happened in our nation's history about 12 years ago this summer. Some of you will remember that Hurricane Katrina made landfall on the Gulf Coast and generated a huge disaster. Many of you remember that the storm flooded New Orleans and killed more than 1,800 people and caused over $100 billion in property damage. The storm's damage was greatly exacerbated by the fact that the uh, the failures of Congress, the current administration, and the Federal Emergency uh, Management Agency known as FEMA. Weather forecasters warned government officials about Katrina's approach, so they should have been ready for it. But they were not. And Katrina exposed major failures in America's disaster preparedness and response systems. And here are a few of the key federal failures. There was confusion. Key federal officials were not proactive, and they were not adequately trained. In a 2006 bipartisan House report on the disaster entitled, A Failure of Initiative, the report said federal agencies had varying degrees of unfamiliarity with their roles, responsibilities, And the report found that there was a general confusion over mission assignments, deployments, and command structure. There was also a failure to learn. The government was unprepared for Katrina, even though it was widely known that such a hurricane was probable. And even though that weather forecasters had accurately predicted the advance of Katrina and had accurately predicted where it would make landfall. And a year prior to Katrina... Government agencies had performed a simulation exercise called Hurricane Pam for a hurricane of similar strength hitting New Orleans. But unfortunately, government agencies failed to learn the important lessons from that exercise. And then there were also supply failures. Many of you will remember. FEMA wasted huge amounts of supplies during this event. It delivered millions of pounds of ice to holding centers in cities far away from the Gulf Coast. And then two years after the storm, the agency ended up throwing away over $100 million in just unused ice. FEMA failed big time because they were simply unprepared. They failed because they didn't do what they were supposed to with the information and the situation that was in front of them. This morning, we're going to talk about a parable of Jesus that's found in the book of Matthew. And in the Bible, we see that Jesus tells stories, and we call them parables, and these stories have a purpose of of relating things for us. And in order to understand a parable, we have to look at a few key things. First of all, many of us may have heard the old statement that uh, a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. But this morning, I think a better statement may be that a parable is an earthly story with a practical meaning. We also have to keep ourselves from pressing all of the details. See, a parable is not a one-for-one analogy with a meaning in every single part. We also have to look for one main point. Why is Jesus telling this story? And then we also have to maybe look at some cultural relation. So we're going to dig into first century Jewish culture a bit this morning. And once we understand these pieces then we have to identify who we are in the story, figure out what characters are in the story, and then weed out the ones that we are not. Typically, you'll find a character in the story that represents God or Christ. For example, in the parable of the prodigal son, you can probably bet that you are not the father. (laughs) We are usually the character that we least want to be. And once we have figured out all of these elements we can then finally start to see the meaning in Jesus' story and how it applies to our lives. So, the parable we're going to look at this morning is the parable of the ten bridesmaids. It's found in Matthew 24 and 25, specifically 25, but we're going to cut back a bit to get some context. See, these aren't just stories that take place. They don't just come up in a vacuum. These weren't stories that Jesus told as he was tucking the disciples in at night. These are stories with an intent. And so what is the purpose of this particular story? In Matthew 24, Jesus and the disciples are leaving the temple. And the twelve are acting like tourists, maybe at the National Mall. They're looking around, they're, they're pointing at the architecture and the buildings, and they're maybe ooing and eyeing. And Jesus hears them. 
And he gives them a reality check and calls them back to the moment. And in verse 2, he says, Do you see all these things? He asked. Truly, I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. It gets quiet, and nobody really says anything for a while. Instead, they were maybe confused and maybe a little embarrassed at the moment. So they walk quietly for the next mile and a half to the Mount of Olives. In verse 3, As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? They wanted to know about when the temple would be destroyed and what the sign would be of the second coming. He proceeds to give them some warnings about what is to come over the next century and for the rest of time. Now, we're not going to get into all of the details for time's sake, but the picture he paints is pretty bad. It makes the coming years look like a pretty terrible future. There's going to be wars and destruction, nations rising and falling, persecution and desolation, human sacrifice, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. It's a pretty, it's a pretty ugly picture. And he doesn't give them much on the whole when question either. Instead, he tells them in verse 36, but about the day or the hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Let's skip down to verse 42. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you must also be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. So there's the context of our parable. Jesus was trying to answer the question of when and what the sign would be, what they should expect. Let's dive in here. Chapter 25, verses 1 through 13 is what we'll be looking at this morning. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Okay, so we've already got our characters. There's the bridegroom and there's ten virgins. Guess which one you're not? That's right. You're probably one of the virgins. So the question is, is which one? Let's keep digging. Verse 2. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. Well, which one do you hope you are? We know what wise means. But Jesus just called five of these girls a Greek word, morai, which is the nominative plural feminine form of moros, which loosely translated means moron. Now, I don't want Jesus to feel like he has to call me a moron. So, how do I avoid that? Well, let's see what they did to become morons. The morons took their lamps, but did not take any oil with them. Now, I don't think these girls forgot that oil lamps require oil to work. They may have put some oil in their lamps, but just didn't take extra with them. But many scholars agree that their lamps weren't full and may not have even had any oil in the reservoir. Now, to give you a picture of what this oil lamp would have looked like, it was probably a little bowl that held a little amount of oil and fit in the palm of their hand, and there was a wick spout. It's very simple. It's probably not the same type you're used to when grandma used to get out the oil lamp when the power went out. So, verse 4. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. They knew that their little lamp wasn't going to take much oil, so they brought extra. They brought extra oil. These girls are like zombie apocalypse preppers. They have gas cans attached to their backs, ready to refill these lamps throughout the night. Verse 5, the bridegroom was a long time coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. How many guys do you know are the ones that are late? Just kidding. I remember when I was a child wanting to stay up really late at night for New Year's Eve. And I remember year after year falling asleep because I was just too tired. Now I typically just go to bed at 10 o'clock and call it a year. 
these girls fell asleep. Maybe they've been working all day, prepping for this wedding they're going to. They're exhausted. They're just tired, and they fell asleep. Well, Chris, that's not a very hard concept. That's not really deep. They fell asleep. So what? Exactly. It's not difficult to understand. It's pretty common, actually. I'm sure most of you sleep from time to time. They fell asleep because they were waiting so long for the bridegroom. Similar to how we have waited over 2,000 years for the second coming. And nobody knows how much longer we'll have to wait. Not even the angels in heaven. Verse 6. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Now, it's the middle of the night. Why is the bridegroom just now showing up? Did he stop for gas? Did his GPS get him lost? Why wait until midnight to arrive? Well, this happens to be an area where first century Jewish culture can help us. The wedding ceremonies of the first century, the the custom would be that the groom would gather his friends together and then would travel through the streets at night to the bride's family's house and gather the bride and and her friends. And then they would travel back through the streets kind of in a, a party and in a partying mood, and go back to the groom's fa- uh, family's house where there would be festivities. And they would celebrate there together for several days before the actual wedding ceremony. Most likely, these bridesmaids are waiting for the groom and his party to arrive to come fetch them to go to his home. Now, the lamps. The partiers would use lamps or even torches to light their way through these events. There's no street lights, obviously. But lamps would need to be refilled and torches would need to be re-soaked throughout the night. And if someone joined the party who didn't have a lamp or a torch, they would be looked at as a party crasher and they'd be kicked out of the festivities. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. Trimming their lamps refers to refilling the oil or prepping their lamp. They were preparing for the evening now that the groom had finally arrived. Verse 8, but the moron said to the wise, give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. Now, these girls were morons because they brought lamps but didn't bring oil to fill their lamp with. When they say our lamps are going out, they're trying to cover up and minimize their mistake and seem maybe even less foolish. They were aware of the situation that they were in, that if their lamps didn't have oil and couldn't light, they weren't going to be accepted in the festivities. So they tried to compensate for their lack by asking for help from those who were actually prepared with extra. Verse 9, no, the wise replied, there may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. Now the wise girls told the morons no. See, they didn't want to get left out of the festivities either. The Thanksgiving after Tabby and I got married, she told me that we were going to go Black Thursday shopping. So we ended up at Walmart in Redneckville, Florida. And I remember standing in the garden section and I was watching this sweet old lady who was waiting for like a 42-inch screen TV or something. And I'm not kidding, this woman who seemed so sweet and innocent, turned into a demon before my very eyes. <laughs> she wanted that TV. See, friends become strangers when something really important is on the line. When something is so dire and so important, we forget the connections we have. These wise girls are not going to let these morons get any of their oil and possibly damage their standing in these festivities. It's important to them. By the way, how many wedding parties have you seen where the girls weren't mostly all friends, right? They're probably, they probably all know each other, and these wise girls probably know how airheaded these morons are. They were probably the girls that waited until the last minute to do the term paper in college. So they told them no. Instead, they tell them to go to the marketplace and buy some oil. Now, Correct me if I'm wrong, but the passage says that it's midnight. Where are these morons going to go? There's no Quickie Mart or 7-Eleven open at this time. 
I somehow doubt that there were many options for these girls to go get oil at this time of night. But despite the time, the passage does tell us that they did eventually acquire some oil. Verse 10, But while they were on their way to buy some oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Y'all saw that coming, right? Every time you're waiting for the plumber or the Comcast guy to arrive, and they say they'll be there between 9 and 5, what time do they arrive? 6. Well, usually maybe while you're indisposed, maybe uh, taking care of something and not really a convenient time, right? But these virgins who were ready, they were able to go into the wedding banquet. They were allowed to participate in the festivities because they were dressed, ready, and prepared. And the door was shut. We've seen this previously in Scripture in the book of Genesis when God shut the door to the ark. Those who were prepared were accepted into the ark and the door was shut. So what does that tell you here? Verse 11, Later the morons also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. Like valley girl style, I don't know. So the morons finally arrive to the wedding banquet. And they finally get there, and they're knocking on the door, trying to get in, trying to be accepted, because they still want to participate. Verse 12, But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not even know you. The groom denies knowing them at all. He doesn't let them in because of their foolishness, their lack of being prepared. All right, that's our story. So now it's time to do some analyzing. Let's talk about some of these elements first. We're going to start with the number of the bridesmaids. Throughout Scripture, we've been taught that numbers in Scripture are significant. And we need to pay attention to them often. What are the big ones? 7, 10, 12, and 40 are common. The number 10 in this parable seems significant. It's even, it's... It's a nice big round number, but quite frankly, it's, it's not significant. It's really very insignificant. The ten bridesmaids was just a good number to, to illustrate the point. It's about the size of a typical wedding party anyway. So not a, not a really complex element. But then what about the oil? The oil must represent something. Many scholars have argued and debated that the oil maybe represents good works or the Holy Spirit. And this would imply that the wise bridesmaids had plenty of good works that got them into the wedding. Or they had more of the Holy Spirit than the foolish bridesmaids. Unfortunately, this idea falls apart as we understand that good works doesn't get you into heaven. And the indwelling of the Holy Spirit doesn't come in such varying measure. So much like the number 10 in this parable, oil is just simply oil. It's a a simple tool used by Jesus to demonstrate whether these girls are prepared or unprepared. Now, I realize this is not a very complicated understanding of the analysis of these elements, but that should help you understand how simple and not complicated this parable really is. So now that we've picked apart the elements, what's the main point? Let's look at verse 13. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. Keep watch. Be alert, in some versions. Be alert or be ready, because you don't know when the bridegroom is going to return. Well, Chris, I I think I'm ready. The bridesmaids thought they were ready. The wise bridesmaids actually were ready and prepared. But how were they ready? They brought oil with them. They were prepared for their lamps to be used throughout the entire festivities. They had spent time gathering the the, uh, necessary resources to make sure that they were accepted by the bridegroom. But the morons weren't ready. They may have thought they were. They may have even wanted to be. But the problem is they simply didn't take the time to prepare. Remember I said at the beginning, we were also going to have to identify who we are in the story. So, like I said, you don't get to be the bridegroom. That one's taken. So, what's left is the virgins, the bridesmaids. 
wise or foolish? Which one are you? Well, what separates them? Preparedness. Whether or not they had taken the time to prepare. So how ready are you for the coming of Christ? We often think that someone is most ready for the second coming on Sunday morning after church service before they pull off this lot and on to 97. After that, it's probably anybody's guess. But really, it isn't about how sinless you are or feel. It isn't about the last time you had communion or were at church. See, I don't think that Gabriel is going to blow his horn between the hours of 10.30 and 12 on Sunday morning. It may happen when you're in Bible study. Does that mean that those things, Bible study and church and communion, aren't important? No, absolutely not. They're very important. But being at church on Sunday or on Wednesday evening even, that's not going to translate to a get-out-of-hell-free card. Perfect attendance doesn't make you a good Christian. And God may return when you're at church. He might. He also may return when you're making a certain gesture to another driver. He may return when you're praying or listening to 95.1. Could happen. Or he may return during your most embarrassing and most compromising situation. You're not going to be a perfect person. God knows that. You're never going to know when he's coming. There's no way to tell. So you must always be ready. You can't reach total holiness, nor can you be perfect all the time. But you can be righteous, and you can make your best effort to worship and love God. See, the foolish virgins were the ones who were unprepared. We need to be like the wise virgins. We need to be prepared. But what does that look like? Being prepared means that you are covered by grace and that you are faithful and obedient to God's commands. Being ready means that you are evangelizing and that you are near to the heart of God. So how are we prepared? We're prepared through grace. Growing close and remaining close to God will prepare you for an eternity in heaven with Christ. But in order to be fully prepared for when Christ comes, you must have acceptance of grace. Here at Sovereign Christian Church, we believe that salvation is received through grace, but there are some key things that have to be done. This should sound familiar to many of you who have been here maybe for the last several weeks. As we've been talking about our Keys to a Better Life series, we've been talking about things like preaching and faith, repentance, baptism, and good works. See, we are instructed in Scripture that in order to receive salvation, we must have faith in Jesus Christ and believe in his resurrection. We have to confess him as Lord and then repent by turning away from our sinful life and walk with and toward Christ. We demonstrate our obedience in this by having our sins washed away in water baptism and then faithfully obey all the commandments that we see in the New Testament about how to live a life for Christ. That's how you become prepared. All of those things prepare you for the coming bridegroom. Earlier I mentioned the catastrophe that was Hurricane Katrina. Katrina killed more than 1,800 people. And the reason that these people died is because they simply weren't prepared. Many survivors noted that the fact that they believed that the storm was not going to be as bad as they were predicting. They didn't think it was going to be so bad, so they hold up. New Orleans only prepared for a Category 3, but Katrina peaked at a Category 5. These people underestimated the power of the storm that was coming and the damage it would bring. Similarly, people underestimate the power of the second coming and the eternal outcome that it will bring. Christ is coming. Therefore, be ready. Be ready for your bridegroom. Don't be a moron. Don't be foolish. Don't be unprepared.
unprepared. Be wise. Be like the wise virgins who prepared for what they knew was coming. Are you prepared? It's a simple question. At this time in our service, We want to invite anybody who may need to make a decision for Christ, either in baptism or by placing membership here. If you want to do that, all you need to do is come forward this morning. We'd love to talk with you. We'd love to talk with you about what steps may need to be taken. Maybe if you want just more information or someone to talk with, mark that on your connection card and put it in the offering bag as it's passed. Give us that opportunity to connect with you. We want to sit and pray with you. We want to talk with you. We want to make sure that you have the answers you need to make a decision so that you're prepared. So take a moment to honor God at this time as well. This is the time in our service when we're going to take up an offering. We're going to give back to God. We're going to worship Him through financial stewardship. Right now, if you want to worship Him and give back to Him, Go ahead and put that that gift and that offering for everything that he's blessed us with in the offering. I'm going to go ahead and pray for our time. Father, we come before you right now thankful for your sacrifice, for your love, for the opportunity that we have to be in your house this morning. Father, I thank you so much for how deep your love goes, that you would sacrifice your son so that we could be prepared to live an eternity with you. Father, if someone here needs to make a decision for you, if you're touching their heart this morning, I I ask that you would press them to come forward and to, to talk with our leadership. Father, I also thank you so much for the blessings that you've given our lives, that you provide for us and provide for our needs and take care of us. Father, please accept this gift back to you that, that we just want to honor you with and worship you through. Father, be with us today. Pray us all these things in your son's name.